Hey, welcome back everyone. Today I have with me one of the most influential rifles in the development of modern firearms and what some consider to be the first modern firearm. This is the Fusil de Infantry Model 1886 Modifi 1893 Label, or simply the Rifle of Infantry Model 1886 Modified 1893 Label, invented during the Third French Republic. I'm really excited to be showing you this piece because it really is one of those guns that not only has a fascinating history but also looks elegant and is something every military arms buff should know about. The Label saw service in every corner of the world where the French were, from the trenches of Verdun in the First World War to the deserts of Morocco and Algeria in the hands of the French Foreign Legion, and in this particular rifle's case as a movie prop in Hollywood. The 1886 Labelle is chambered in the 8x50mm rimmed Labelle cartridge and has a tubular magazine that holds 8 rounds and it also weighs just over 9 pounds. It was also issued with a epi bayonet that has a 20 inch blade and then you know as far as production numbers go they made about 3.5 million and these were produced from 1887 to roughly 1916. And this rifle continued to see service even 100 years after it was invented. First off, the Labelle is put in such a legendary light because it was the first firearm in the world to utilize a new propellant, smokeless powder. Now, if you don't know what this means, let's take a step back. Traveling in time to the invention of gunpowder in 9th century China, all the way to the 1880s, it was a standard for armies around the world to use black powder in their firearms. However, traditional black powder is unstable, it's incredibly dirty, and doesn't exert the velocities that modern armies were looking for in a powder. However, smokeless powder is exactly what it sounds like. A powder that is cleaner, produces less fouling, and because of its chemical properties, gives the bullet a flatter trajectory and longer distance with each shot. The Labelle has a muzzle velocity of 2300 feet per second, while its earlier black powder competitors, like the Mauser model 1871, had a muzzle velocity of roughly 1400 feet per second. The 19th century saw a massive arms race in Europe, with major nations continually trying to get an edge on each other. Earlier in the 19th century, Prussia had invented and adopted the needle gun, which was an early bolt-action rifle that used a needle to penetrate a self-contained cap in the cartridge, while other nations used external hammers to ignite their cartridges. With a growing rivalry between France and Prussia, France returned in kind to invent their version of the needle gun, the Chasse Poe, in 1866. The Prussian and French needle guns went head-to-head -head during the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, and despite the 2-to-1 range performance of the French Chasse Poe, Prussia still won the conflict. Following the American Civil War, many armies around the world began adopting faster, single-shot breech-loading rifles, which housed metallic cartridges, and in turn increased the individual soldier's firepower. With the arms race continuing, France introduced the Gras Model 1874, which used a single-shot metallic cartridge and was a pretty solid rifle, but it still wasn't good enough if you wanted to beat your neighbor in a war. Well, in 1884, French chemist Paul Viel invented a new propellant called Powder B, which was three times more powerful than black powder, and it didn't create a plume of smoke when fired like with traditional black powder. So in order to quickly capitalize and take advantage of this new state secret Powder B, a committee was formed with French General Tremont appointed as project lead and was given one year to create a new rifle for the French military. In short, they took bolt and magazine elements from the Gras and Kropotchek rifles, and after several prototypes and tinkering around with a couple different variants, they came up with this, the 1886 Labelle, and by 1887, they were producing these in factories in full swing. So, you know, why did they call this rifle the Labelle? Well, it was actually named for the guy who designed the original 8mm bullet for the cartridge, Colonel Nicholas Labelle. So it used the Ball M or Ball Labelle bullet, and, you know, it had a nice ring to it, so it kind of stuck. After the Labelle came onto the scene, it actually had a profound influence on not only arms manufacturing, but also geopolitics. Germany actually refrained from invading France that summer and started a new evolution of rifles made in smokeless powder. The era of black powder for military purposes had more or less come to an end. Uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and take a closer look at this rifle. We see on the right side of the barrel is the manufacturer's letter code next to the year it was manufactured. So this one says MAT or Manufacture National des Arms des Tools or National Manufacturing of Arms at Tool and was made in 1888. 
The Model 1886 Lebel was most commonly manufactured at three state-owned facilities at Chateau-Leroux, Saint-Otien, and Toul. There were also various less common producers as well. As a side note on the manufacturer, Toul was founded in 1691 near what is today central France after several local gunsmiths and their financial backers came together and formed the armory. Eventually it would become a royal armory in 1777 and then was nationalized as a state-owned enterprise from 1886 onwards being heavily involved in the production of small arms until at least the 1980s. Okay, on the left side of the barrel is the serial number right here, obviously, which has a faint letter prefix right here. This would denote the series of the rifle with each series block containing about 100,000 rifles. After 100,000 rifles were made, they would start over with the next letter in the series they were assigned. The national government would assign the different series codes to various manufacturing plants with two being assigned the codes R, S, T, U, and V right here. This is the code. It's a very faint R with the production of the R series running from 1887 to 1888. This would have been just shy of the 100,000th rifle manufactured at this factory. Right above the serial number here is a single letter code for the private steel firm that provided the materials for the barrel. Again, this one is very faint. It's a very faint single B, which stands for Bedell Persephil at C. Pedel Per and his sons at C, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. This could sometimes be marked by two letters depending on what steel supplier you had. To the right is two barely visible uppercase Bs that are circled, and these are the factory controller stamps, meaning that they have been inspected and improved. The first letter is from the supervising officer at the plant and the director of manufacturing, and the second one right to the right of that is the inspector or principal arms controller. So the first B in this case stands for Commandant Jules Bourdon, who was the director of Tool from 1883 to 1889. On the side of the receiver, we have the manufacturer spelled out, Manufacture de Arms Tool, followed by MLE 1886 Modafi 93. The reason these are technically called model 1886 93s are because in 1893 the bolts were modified to allow for escaping gas in the event of a ruptured cartridge. Almost all the bells were converted so it's very difficult to find one that is not upgraded to this 93 configuration. Looking at the top of the receiver it's notched right here where the barrel and the receiver line up. In 1932, the French designed an updated ball and ammunition for their machine guns, and so existing stockpiles of Lobels had their receivers modified for this more powerful cartridge and had an N marked on the top right around here. Now, what is interesting, this of course doesn't have that N mark, which means it was likely out of France before this year. Commercially made modern ammunition is still perfectly fine to shoot in this gun, however, since they no longer manufacture the ball and ammunition for machine guns. Looking at the rear sights, we have a graduated ramp that goes from 400 to 800 meters and a ladder that goes from 850 to 2400 meters, and you can see the number indicators right here, and then a fixed battle sight that is set for 400 meters when flipped forward. Because my rear sight is a little bit bent, it's actually most accurate at the 600 mark. On the buttstock, we have an extremely worn out cartouche that you can kind of see here, which would have the date listed that this rifle would have been accepted into service by the military. Many times this could be a few months after it was actually manufactured, but a lot of these are just barely noticeable. We have a generic butt plate here with a screw at the bottom and then a screw at the top. And then we also see this figure 15T, which I'm actually not entirely sure what this stands for. And then of course, you have the Arsenal series plus the serial number, and this one was of course crossed out a couple times and put with the new serial number because, again, a lot of these labels went through damages and were fixed up during the war. What is unique about the 8mm ammunition is that the cartridges themselves had grooves built into the brass, which was added in the later Ball D AM cartridges when they were fitted with pointed nose bullets. Since these pointed or spitzer nose cartridges were tube fed, the grooves would allow the ammunition to be stacked sideways without the bullets sitting on the primers in front of them. And this is actually worked out pretty well. These are dummy cartridges, but as you can see, instead of the spitzer round, 
hitting the primer in front of it, which was always an issue with tube fed magazines. It sits in these little grooves when it was sitting flat in this tube. Loading the magazine is done by hand with each cartridge being loaded in one at a time until eight are in the tube, and then you can fit one on the elevator. You have to bring the bolt back briskly, which brings the elevator up, and when the new round is chambered, the elevator will drop in a spring, and the tube magazine will push the round in waiting onto the elevator. Obviously, one of the main drawbacks was loading time. When the other countries in World War I were using stripper clips, these had to be individually hand-loaded. Another drawback was the fact that every time a round was fired, the balance of the tube changed, so there was not a whole lot of continuity there. If you didn't want the soldier to have access to the full magazine at once, you could have them engage the magazine cutoff here, which prevents the elevator from going down. This would be used to preserve ammunition usage, as was standard for many early bolt-action rifles. There's no safety on this rifle, as it was intended to be carried without a single round in the chamber. So, magazine cutoff is engaged, and the elevator will no longer go down, so you can just put a single round inside of it. But it comes off quite easily, and you can easily move the elevator back down. Now what is interesting about this particular rifle is that on the grip, we see a stamp that says WC Co. This stands for Western Costume Company, which was a major Hollywood prop supplier founded in 1912 and was at the time like the sole supplier of costumes and props for film studios in early Hollywood. The film industry had purchased an enormous amount of surplus rifles over the decades, and the Western Costume Company once boasted that it could arm an entire 10,000-man force equipped with guns and full costumes. In fact, Hollywood has so many guns that they could probably be considered the largest private owner of firearms in the world. Unfortunately, many of the prop rental companies never tracked or current records do not exist of what firearms went with what film since they would just rent them out to studios who use them in different pictures. While it would be neat to say that this was this particular rifle was used in Stanley Kubrick's Paths of Glory starring Kirk Douglas, it's really impossible to prove. There's also so many times where in older films, background extras would be given period inaccurate rifles because, you know, who's going to be paying attention to the indistinguishable figure in the corner or in a larger battle scene? And you'll also find this exact stamp on many other guns that were used as movie props from the Western Costume Company, but you'll also see various different stamps used on different firearm props, like MGM and RKO, which would just have their acronym stamped on a, a rifle, or the 20th Century Fox would just have FOX in all uppercase. In the early 1990s, most of the prop rental companies auctioned off most of their props in massive sales since much of their inventory was old or outdated, and these large epic films where you needed to clothe thousands of people at once were being replaced. This included a sale of most of their firearms, which were well used at this point. Props were thrown around, abused, dropped, and sometimes heavily modified, so most of these rifles auctioned off were not in the best condition, and unless you were associated with a particular film or individual, they were probably not collector-grade weapons. Somehow, this one made it to Hollywood and was used in who knows what films and then retired after many years of use. Just a quick mention of the Epi Bayonets, or the Rosalies as they were called. Originally, they started out with handles made of nickel and they had quillions, but due to wartime rationing meant that they ditched the quillion and then made the handles out of brass. These two are at the original blade length of 20 inches, but many of these were cut down to shorter lengths after the war. Now, like my rifle here, you'll notice that there are a lot of dings and scratches, uh, mismatched parts, uh, serial numbers don't match up, stacking rod is missing, uh, some of the text and letters are very faint and not entirely visible. Well, these guns are you know, extremely old, and since they were frontline rifles for so long in the French military, they were well used. Thousands of these were destroyed in combat, sent in for repairs, and like this one was probably dropped a million times during whatever film it was used in. You know, despite the fact that the updated 1907-15 Berthier rifle was more adapt for modern warfare than the 1886 Labelle, the 1886 Labelle continued to be the main frontline arm for the military during the First World War, just because the logistics of existing stockpiles made it the most numerous rifle available to the French military, though Berthiers began to come into larger numbers in the last half of the war. 
Labels were also shipped to many Balkan countries during the war, such as Serbia as war aid, as well as to Imperial Russia, and you'll find the French weapons in pretty much every theater of the conflict. You know, with World War I over, the 1886 Labelle wasn't counted out of service in all circumstances. Uh, it was kept on as the main arm of the French Foreign Legion for a time, and many of these were actually shortened down to carbines in 1935 by the French government, dubbed the Model 1886, uh, 93R35. And even when France adopted their new Moss 36, of course in 1936, the Labelles were still used in large numbers during World War II, as they were still quite plentiful. During the wars, uh, you use what weapons you have available to you, not necessarily the ones that you would like to use. So that was a problem that France encountered during the First World War and the Second World War, where production of the Moss 36s were not quite up to the numbers that they were looking for. So they had to supplement the, you know, shortage with labels. Um, you know, post-World War II, they still saw action in many places with reserve units in Indochina and Algeria as France was struggling to keep its colonial empire together and were used by dozens of countries over a very long period of time. You know, today the 1886 labels are heavily sought after by collectors and they really don't sit on shelves for very long. While they did make millions of these rifles over the course of, you know, 20 to 30 years, a lot of them were destroyed in combat, and as World War I history becomes more popular in the American mainstream, these guns also become more wanted. But, you know, I'm lucky enough to have one, and I enjoy the history of it. So guys, this was a very long episode from what I typically do, but, you know, there was a lot of detail to include, and, you know, frankly, there's room for a lot more detail that I left out. So, thanks for watching until the end if, if you've been able to do that. And if you enjoy this kind of content, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.